Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. So I was introduced to the fellowship back in 1985, and I wasn't an alcoholic. I was 25 years old. I knew something was wrong. Everybody knew something was wrong with me, but I I didn't know. I was the last one to find out. Uh, so after the reading that, that John did this morning, I want to turn to page 551 in the big book, because this will be like, this has come up my, um, my story, because it's all going to relate and tie in. And on page 551, um, I think the one, two, the third paragraph down, it states uh, the chapter is uh, freedom from bondage, right? And it says, this resentment was against my mother. And it was 25 years old. It ha- I had fanned it, I had fed it, I had fanned it, and nurtured it as one might a delicate child. And it had become as much a part of me as my breathing. It had provided me with excuses for my lack of education, my marital status or failures, personal failures, inadequacy, and of course, my alcoholism. Now, I'm going to share a little something with you, and I don't uh, mean to be provocative or stimulate anyone else's side issues. Um, But all this has to do with my alcoholism. Um, What I thought caused me to become an alcoholic or made me an alcoholic, and today I know that that's not true. The book also has taught me and the programmers taught me after doing some work and that I thought that I was the result of the things that had happened to me in my early childhood. But what the program has shown me is that I'm the result of the way I reacted to those things that happened to me in my early childhood. So I had an uncle that um, I was eight years old, um, violated my personal security. Okay. And I come up in the uh, 50s, 60s, and 70s, and 80s, right? So back then, you were a child. You were to be seen and not heard. You were always to respect your adults. You did what they told you to do, even if you didn't like it or you didn't agree with it. Um, if, in fact, someone told you to do something that you didn't agree with and you had a problem with it once – you know, the main adult, which would be my mother, uh, would come home. I would talk to her about it. But the adult was very clever, and they were manipulative, and they instilled fear. And they told me that if I said anything, that I would lose my family. My dad, I don't think he's, I don't, well, we don't diagnose anyone as an alcoholic, right? (laughs) That's a self-diagnosed disease. But my father sure had all the uh, familiar symptoms of an alcoholic. Okay, um, so I don't know if I became an alcoholic because it's genetically transferred in the genes or if I was just born with it or if uh, I know <laughs> or if I crossed that invisible line that the book talks about. But I came to find out after going into treatment, and I've been through 29 treatment facilities, <laughs> and I'm not proud of that, but I, I really was trying to do something about the, my problem. And it shows you just how extensive my search was, right, to try to to try to fix myself. And what I understood later on is that there was no way to fix me because I was beyond human aid. I had to be healed from my malady. Um, so while I was inside of this treatment facility, they had something called a, uh, a family afterwards, right? That's where they come in, family dynamics and I got an opportunity to confront my mother because I had told my mother a year later after the incident what had happened to me. And she denied my reality and said, I was just looking for attention and sent me back to my room. I can remember seeing red. I was angry. I was hurt. I felt betrayed and I felt abandoned. I was already feeling feelings of abandonment because of my dad. 
and that wasn't uh, his fault. My mother decided because he was abusive and he was drunk that she was going to leave, and she did when I was one years old. So now I'm having feelings of abandonment with my mom. And that's why I read that little statement. In the back of the book, we have 42 personal stories. And when we're new into the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous, it's suggested, that's one of the first assignments that you know the book suggests, right? To go to the back of the book, if you don't know if you're an alcoholic, and read one of the 42 personal stories. I read them all. <laughs> and I was able to identify, and I was able to relate with the thinking, the feeling, and the drink, and the drinking. Um, even though I still didn't know what an alcoholic was. I had a misconception for many, many years. I thought an alcoholic was someone who stood on the corner passing around a bottle with a bunch of a group of guys, or maybe the alcoholic was somebody that was sleeping on a dirty mattress in the back of an alley, right, with a wine bottle hanging out of their back pocket in a brown paper bag. Or perhaps the alcoholic was someone who was standing in front of a liquor store. And handling for change so they could get their next drink. And though all these people might be an alcoholic, that's not what an alcoholic is, according to the Big Book of Alcoholics Anonymous. This is a twofold illness. The book likes to describe it as a disease. And a disease is just a condition that separates me from health. Um, it's a disease of the mind, a mental obsession. An obsession is a thought or an idea that outweighs all of the thoughts or ideas. And it has a physical component. I have a hypersensitivity to a specific substance, and that substance is alcohol. It's a physical allergy. It's a phenomenon. It doesn't happen in the average moderate or tempered drinker. It happens only in alcoholics. They say that uh, I'm a unique individual, right, uh, in the doctor's opinion, uh, that I'm a specific type. And the type I am is what they call a, a hopeless variety. Uh, on page 20 and 21, they describe three types of drinkers. One is a moderate drinker. This person can take it or leave it alone. The next one is a hard drinker. This person, right, uh, may drink and then become abusive like my dad. Uh, to his wife and kids, might have problems on the job might be in jeopardy of getting fired or could come up with a health issue and be for fear of maybe losing their life, uh, this person can stop or moderate too. But then it jumps over to page 21 and it says, but what about the real alcoholic, right? This is the person that they say has been puzzling everybody because they have all the reasons in the world to be able to quit. Uh, I'll give you some examples of that. Um, what fit in the bottle of alcohol for me was a nine-year marriage, a nine-year banking career, a nine-year military career, two beautiful daughters, a five-year workers' compensation career, and a three-year college career with a 3.9 GPA, nine units short of a KDAC certification for the state of California in drug and alcohol technology. Those two beautiful daughters, um, an inheritance three times over, right? Uh, over a million dollars worth of real estate property, <laughs> life insurance policies. I could go on at, at, you know what I mean? These were the things that were left to me by my mom, my dad, and uh, I squandered it. I did try to spend some some of the money on getting help from myself. Once again, I've been through 29 programs and I thought that the programs were inadequate that were just being offered through the county where I lived. So now I had enough money to be able to go into and get some real treatment, right? <laughs> real treatment. So I went to these places in Arizona. I thought what I needed to do is I needed to make a change. I thought California was my problem. And so I decided to go to Arizona. But prior to going, if I hadn't been listening to my sponsor, um, which I, I, I had, but it was only entitled, I wasn't following the suggestions or the directions. I was still running on self-will. And I decided to make this geographic. And I need to let you know, um, 
I drank before I ever got to, I even got to Arizona. And so the problem continued even in Arizona. And that's what they told me. They said, Lindell, if you can't stay sober in California, what makes you think you're going to go to Arizona and stay sober? And what I realized they were saying to me is no matter where I go, I take me with me. <laughs> right. So um, uh, there's another book I'll, I'll share with you. It's called uh, A New Pair of Glasses by one of our elder statesmen, rest in peace, uh, uh, Chuck C. And one of the statements in the book says, until I know what the problem is, there is no solution. And today I know I'm the problem. It's a matter of six inches between this gray matter up here and my head. Um, so I went to these programs because I couldn't get sober. And one was a $10,000 program. I spent about six months in there. And that was gestalt therapy. And that was, um, it, it, it was intense. But it still didn't keep me from drinking. And so I sought out another program. This one had a better reputation. And so I went there. It's called The Meadows. And that was $25,000 a month. And I stayed there for seven months. So basically what I'm saying is I spent over $250,000 for a big book, right? Because after you leave the programs, that's where they send you. They send you to the 12-step programs, right? Specifically, in my case, I'll call it synonymous. But what I'm sharing that story with you for is because back in 1985, when I received that friendly nudge from the judge and he sent me to the Virgilano Club located in Hawthorne, California, that was the very first introduction I had to alcohol Anonymous. And they gave me my very first big book for free. Right? And they gave me a 12 and 12. So that, that, that makes me refer to page 28 of our big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. Because it says what I thought at first to be a flimsy read has proven to be the loving and powerful hand of God. I just didn't know it then because I hadn't accepted the fact that I'm an alcoholic, which brings me to the first step, right? Which is located on page 30 of our big book in the chapter more about alcoholism. And it says, until I can conceive or admit to my innermost self that I am an alcoholic, that there's little hope of my recovery, right? And I drank, my drinking career lasted approximately 57 years. And I went to any less to drink. What I mean there is that up under the influence of alcohol, I will do just about anything that comes to the forefront of my mind. The big book likes to describe it as incomprehensible demoralization. So um, I'm going to back up a little bit because what I found out inside of that treatment facility where we did the family dynamics, my mother I got to that, it was a two year program. And uh, I had been in there for 18 months and they had a part where the family or the, the parents get to come to the program and we get to address the issues that uh, were bothering us, right? They were eating our lunch with our parents. And so I got a chance to tell my mother off how I felt and how she, I thought she made me feel. Um, by not listening to me, by not believing me when I told her this traumatic event that had taken place in my life. And I never meant to put that look in my mother's eyes, but she was extremely angry. You see, people didn't talk about their problems then. And today I realized that you're only as sick as your secrets, right? I'm only as sick as my secrets. Um, that was a family secret. Because this uncle not only had violated me, but he had violated my mother. And my mother has five sisters, and he had violated all five of her sisters. And I'm being a little raw with you guys today. And I'm being honest with you guys today. Because I'm letting you know, right? It says that when we share, right? We share. <clears throat> not only an adequate description of the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. But we share... Uh, based on our own experience, strength, and hope, right? Um, and I try to re convey to you how I developed 
and established a relationship with a power greater than myself, a God of my own conception. Because that resentment almost killed me. Not only, <clears throat> but I, so I had, I, it made it a little easier once my mother got honest with me and told me what was going on. But then really it got worse because now, not only did I have a resentment with the uncle, but I had a resentment with my mom, her sisters, and my family, because they all knew. And how could you, and then you, you, he lied to my face and told me that I didn't, it didn't happen. Now I'm really pissed off, right? And I, I started to develop this concoction of resentments. And what is a resentment? A resentment is uh, a deep-seated, unconscious, unresolved conflict. A deep-seated, unconscious, unresolved conflict that recurs, a second obsession, that occurs, reoccurs, going around and around and around in my thinking. And it affected everything. That's what I was telling you, my marriage, right? And when I did the fourth step with my sponsor, um, and, I, and I did try ways to get rid of this resentment. I did try. I was raised as a Christian. I was raised in a Baptist church. I have been dumped, dipped, sprinkled, and dang near drowned, right? <laughs> right? Christians in oil. And I even went to the seminary, and I was there for a year. But two weeks away from the seminary, I drank again. You see, I'm an alcoholic of the hopeless variety. It's a description of step one on page 44 of the alcohol, uh, Alcoholics Anonymous Manual or book or textbook. And it says that if when I honestly want to, I find I cannot quit entirely. Now, I can stop, but I can never stay stopped. Or when drinking, I have little control over the amount I take. I'm probably an alcoholic. And if that be the case, I may be, I may be suffering from an illness, which only a spiritual experience will conquer. And that's why I really love that reading, John, because it says that once the spiritual malady is overcome, then we straighten out both mentally and physically. You see, alcoholism is a chronic illness. It's a, it never goes away. Once an alcoholic, always an alcoholic. I had to learn that. Um, it's also a progressive illness which means it gets worse over any considerable period of time, whether I'm drinking or not. It has to be treated if I'm going to recover. Just like if, if I have cancer, I've, I've got to go to a doctor, I've got to take chemo, I've got, you know what I mean? I've got to do what it takes to, to be rid of the cancer, to at least keep it at bay. So, um, I want to share a little bit of pain because um, on page 52, it talks about the bedevilments. And that was my life. I hated my mother. I guess you might say um, I, I, I was a liar. I was a thief. I was a cheat. I was a fake, a phony, and a fraud. I was a misogynist. So, you know what I mean? I, and it was because my mother failed me my mother abandoned me and that that extended over into other relationships with women so i didn't treat women very well the book likes to describe an alcoholic of my type like a, a dr jekyll mr high i have a double life i have the alcoholic life that i'm living and then i have this normal life that i would like to live and i'm unable to do that because of the alcohol um, I didn't really hate my mother. I loved my mother deeply. I just wanted her to believe in me. I just wanted to have a relationship with her. And ever since I had said those words to her, something changed in the dynamics of our relationship. I could no longer really hug my mother. And I'm an only child. She was my God, right? And she provided everything that I ever needed a roof over my head, food on my stomach. Our cupboards were never bare. She was a hardworking woman. She did cosmetology and, and paid her way through medical school. And then she went to medical school and then she bought some property, a set of apartments, which she left to me. My dad has some houses, a couple of them, and he left those to me. 
So those are the inheritance things, right? The life insurance policies, the brand new cars that I was left. And I squandered those things. And within three years after going to Arizona, I was back in California with my toe tucked between my legs. And I was to spend the next 25 years living on the streets, homeless. But before I go there, my mother, um, I never meant to put that look in her eye. And she was very disappointed because uh, there was hopes of me maybe one day becoming a doctor. I was in parochial schools when I was younger. I spoke Spanish, French, and English, and I did it fluently. I could read, write, I could sing it. Um, but my mother had a bad picker. and I, She went to three husbands, and they were all alcoholics. But when she was married, she was able to put me in those par parochial schools. And uh, I was a very smart kid. And when she got divorced, she had to take me away from those schools. I went to public schools. And I was teased. I was beat up. I was bullied. I had my teeth knocked out. Um, so I had a whole bunch of resentments coming up through life. And, you know, the book says that these are the things that from resentments alone stem all forms of spiritual sickness, right? And I was sick. I was really, really sick, you guys. Um, they had diagnosed me with ADHD, um, al alcohol, alcohol defiance disorder, <laughs> and 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 there's the other ADHD too, attention deficit disorder. Um, they had diagnosed me with anxiety, depression, uh, bipolar. And I was borderline schizophrenic. And I was on medications for all of these. At one point, I was over 360 pounds. And I'm only five foot seven. So I was extremely obese, right? I mean, it affected every area of my life. We're talking about resentment. Um, I was unfaithful to my wife. I wasn't a very good father. I wanted to be a, I wanted to be the ideal dad. I wanted to be the ideal husband, but I couldn't pull it off. My drinking was paramount in my life, even though I didn't see that at the time. Where alcohol took me to living up under bridges, sleeping in the dirt, where people defecated, defecated and urinated and and puked, right? Um, sleeping on the side of freeways and bushes, right? Um, sleeping in abandoned buildings and vacant cars, squatting in other people's homes, uh, eating out of trash cans. Panhandling in front of the liquor store so I could get my next drink. 25 years, I pushed a basket with all my worldly possessions in it. But I didn't, I always had my alcohol. It was no longer my friend. It had quit being my friend a long time ago. It quit working. But now I, I can't stop drinking. And I don't know why. I can stop, but I keep, every time I stop and I build up a bright prospect for my life, I tear the structure down again by a sense, a, a senseless set of sprees, right? And I don't know why I keep doing this. That's the alcoholic insanity. I got a job as a worker's comp investigator, and I had an opportunity to make a six-digit six salary income. And I ruined that career because of my drinking. I was there for four years, going on my fifth year. And I wrecked my car, chasing the claimant. So um, it tells us on page, I think it's page 153 in the back of the big book. I want to make sure I'm right with the pages, but because it's important in case you guys look this stuff up yourself. But um, uh, I think it's 153. Hang on. Let me just go to that.
So I'll, I'll just keep ad libbing until I can get to it. This is that uh, most alcoholics. No, it's not 153. Okay, I'll, I'll tell you the page later. But basically, it says most alcoholics have to be badly mangled before they'll be convinced enough to do something about their drinking. Well, remember when I said I was tore up from the floor up and I needed to check out from the neck out? I mean, that, just, that was so true in my life. Because not only had I been diagnosed with all of those different conditions, um, I came here to Las Vegas to live with my daughter. And um, the next day I got after I got here, I almost passed out and I didn't know why. But my daughter happened to see that. And she said, are you okay? And I said, yeah, I got you know COPD and I think I probably just need to get on my nebulizer machine because uh, I smoked cigarettes for 47 years and it, it affected my lungs. Um, so I have severe COPD. Um, and so I said, so what, what, do we need to go to the hospital? I said, no, I'm fine. Let me just let me just use my machine. I'll be okay. She said, no, Dad, we, we're going to the hospital. <laughs> so she forced me to go to the ER. And, you know, that was just God working through my daughter. Because what I didn't know is how sick I was. You see, after 57 years of drinking, I had, I had done a lot of damage physically to my body. And what happened was uh, it took three days for them to get me into the hospital to get my blood pressure low enough to admit me. And when they finally got me to the ICU, they connected me to all these tubes and monitors. And um, they took my blood. And the next morning, the doctor came in and said, you know, Mr. Waltz, it's a good thing you came in when you did. And I says, why do you say that? He says, because if you didn't, we wouldn't be having this conversation right now. <laughs> I said, so what does that mean? He says, well, it's just for starters, your kidneys are gone, both of them. And he says, I don't even know how you made it in here. You're, you're basically the walking dead. And I said, so I don't understand. He says, well, you, your creatinine levels are so high. They're supposed to be like 1.8 or something like that, 0 0.8 to 1 point something. Mine was over 14. I had so much toxicity inside of my system because all of the poison that was building up. He told me in his professional opinion, if I had to went to sleep tonight, I would not have waken up. I would have went into a toxic coma and they would have had to place me on life support until my daughters made a decision to disconnect me. So I was literally 24 hours away from death, according to the doctor. Um, I have congestive heart failure. I have a weakened heart muscle now. Um, I had bleeding ulcers. That's why I almost passed out and I didn't know it. The red blood cells weren't reproducing and I wasn't getting enough oxygen to my brain and that's why I almost passed out. So they, they had to go in and cauterize those, those ulcers. Um, I had hepatitis C, right? I don't know how I got it, but I got it. I took a treatment heart only for 90 days and so far so good, right? That was in 2009. And then they put me on dialysis in the hospital. I was on dialysis for three years. Um, but before I get to that, uh, I spent six months in this time before, uh, as I got recovery, I spent six months in the hospital. And uh, the first three months they were trying to uh, save my kidneys and they couldn't. So that's why they went ahead and put the catheter in my chest and then I started the dialysis at the hospital and then when I went home uh, to the outpatient uh, they test you first because they don't want you to make the other patients sick it's the dialysis clinic and they give you four days after they test you for COVID-19 to come back and if you're clear you come in and you start your treatments if not uh, you can't come in and so when I came back after those four days they already had an ambulance and a gurney waiting for me and I thought that that would be the last time I would see my daughter because this is that period in 2020 where they're cracking people's chest open with crowbars, going in with their hands and physically massaging their lungs, uh, putting them on incubating machines, right, in order to keep them breathing. And bodies were dying. And they were being packed, packed up in the, stacked up in the hallways and eventually out into the parking lots and containers and uh, bodies on top of bodies and containers on top. You know how many people died in that. And I don't know how I got through it. It was just the grace of God. But I spent 90 days back in there while they tried to save my life. 
tried, alcohol really tried to destroy me. I tried to destroy me because of the hatred that I have with these resentments. So let's get into the work. Step one is the foundation stone of our recovery. What I'm saying there, if you're new, if I don't do a thorough step one, right? if I don't get a firm foundation in step one, there's no need in me doing the other 11 steps. Step two, a childhood God I grew up with, I no longer have that. I had to take several lifelong conceptions and throw them out the window. And I was grateful for the book because it told me that I didn't have to believe in my mother's God. I didn't have to believe in my grandmother's God. I didn't have to believe in the church's God. I didn't have to believe in society's God. I could choose my own conception of God. And that's what I did. Instead of choosing a God that was punishing and, you know, watching every move I made and anything I did wrong, right? If I'm a good boy, I'm going to get all these attaboys. But if I'm a bad boy, he's, he's keeping notes and I'm going to spend my time in uh, fire and brimstone and hell and damnation. No, I am today. I have a loving God. I have a merciful God. I have a forgiving God. I have an all powerful God. And then the third step, right? Um, in the hospital, uh, I had an opportunity to examine my relationship with, with alcohol. And I was able to answer this really important question that I like to tell people to consider for themselves. And, you know, it was, is alcohol doing more to me than it's doing for me? And I could just look back at the history of my life and see everything that had received and gifts and blessings and, you know what I mean? And everything I destroyed as a result of my drinking, all the loss, the money, the property, the prestige, my kids, my family, my careers, my businesses, anything, right? All that. Or, you know, and so is it doing more to me than it's doing for me? And if I can answer that question honestly, and I was able to answer it honestly, then I knew that I was beyond human aid because nobody was able to help me. The police, the courts, my wife, my my family, my kids, programs, nothing could help me. On page 21 of the 12 and 12, it says, um, it's truly awful to admit that with glass in hand, I have warped my mind into such an obsession for destructive drinking. And I like to add the thinking that only an act of providence, which is an act of God, can remove it from me. You see, that's why I'm beyond human aid, because I'm a hopeless alcoholic. I'm unable to stop, no matter how great the necessity of the wish. Once I put alcohol inside of my system, um, that wife, that late ex-wife, um, she eventually got tired of my craziness, <laughs> my drunkenness, and she legally separated from me and then legally divorced me. And she took my girls away, and that broke my heart. And then I wanted to get my family back. That's what I was doing in that two-year program. I was trying to get my family back. But I want to tell you this, and the reason I'm telling you this story is because any, I found out that anything I put in front of my recovery, I'm going to lose anyway, <laughs> right? My recovery, I said it early, it has to be paramount in my life. Without this program, I'm going to die. I'm thoroughly convinced of that today. Um, so she developed a brain tumor. And uh, they thought they could save her. She, they went in, they did surgery, and uh, she went back on the job, and after two weeks, she collapsed. She went back into the hospital, and six months later, on June 22nd of 1989, she died. And the girls, I wasn't uh, in a position to be able to do anything for my kids at that time, because I was still trying to get help myself. So they went to go live with the uh, other side of the family, her side of the family. And so um, I like to tell you I stayed sober, but I didn't. I drank. And I spent another couple of years out there on the streets. And then it came to me. I said, you know, I do have a couple of kids, and maybe maybe I could do the right thing, and I stand up, get on my feet again, and do right by my kids. So I went in 
to treatment again, right? And I went before the courts and I petitioned the courts to get custody of my girls. And the judge says, Mr. You know, look, Mr. Ross, you got a lot of problems. You got long alcohol history here. And he says, I'm I'm not uh, I'm not real uh, excited about giving you custody of your kids. He says, but this is what I'll do for you. He says, uh, I'll mandate it that you bring me five years. If you can bring me five years of recovery and and re recreate your life, then I I will I will grant you custody of your girl. So there I'm off to the races. That's when I went back to school, right? And I took those courses in drug and alcohol technology to become a social worker. I was in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous, right? I had five years of sobriety, not sobriety, sobriety, because I wasn't working the steps. You know, they have those sheets on the wall in the back of us. Okay, I see that. Um, and uh, I had a sponsor, but only in title wasn't doing the directions or following the suggestions. But I did get that five years and then I got my kids back. And I need to let you know a year after I got those kids back, I drank again and I lost them all over again. So that third step, it tells us, it says we must be ready, right? We think well before taking that step. We have to be sure that we're ready to utterly, which means completely abandon our will and our life. That means our thoughts and our actions over to the care of this higher power. And it says it's just a decision. So the first two steps are conclusions. Okay, I see I got a problem. I, okay, I believe you guys. I think I'm an alcoholic. All right, I don't know what to do about it yet, but okay, yeah, let's go forth from here. And then when you told me I don't have to believe in anything, I just needed a willingness to believe, then I decided, okay, I, I got a willingness to believe in the creator, right? Something like the stars, the moon, the sun. I didn't create that. No man created that. That's a power greater than myself. I'm going with it. So you call it CI, creative intelligence, right? And then uh, I said, but that would have little or lasting effect unless next I launched on a vigorous course of action to be rid of these things that had been blocking me for all of this time. That's the fourth step. And then the first column and the fourth step, I listed the people. Then in the second column, I did the causes. And then... The third column, what it affected, and my sex relations, my personal ambitions, and all of that stuff. And then in that fourth column, that was the hard one because I had to look at the part I played. And I said, what do you mean what part I played? I, I didn't, what did I have to do with the guy that did what he did to me that caused all of this wreckage in the first place? And he says, well, you had a part to play. Were you there? And I said, yeah, I was there. He says, you had a part to play. And the part I found out that I played was I held on to the secret too long. I don't know if I had to gave up the secret earlier that anything would have been any different today, but at least I would have freed myself because I told the truth. And then I could have been honest with therapists. I could have been honest with everybody, but you didn't talk about that stuff. What stayed in our house, in our home, what, what happened in our home stayed in our home. What happened in our family stayed in our family. That was the law. And uh, so once I put all that stuff down on paper and I looked at, my fourth column, I was looking, I was able to look in the mirror at the guy that was staring back at him, and I saw that I had created a monster. That's that Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde. And then, in order to get free from that, um, I had to be willing to share my entire, not part of it, not 75%, not 99.9%, but 100% of my entire life story with another human being. And I had so much resentment, I couldn't do it, guys. So they took me to a, a special workshop. It's called Back to Basics. It's how they took people through the process of recovery in the early days, right? And they went through all 12 steps in a matter of four hours. It took me five because I tried to hold off on some of the really deep, dark stuff. And my sponsor told me, he says, well, let me ask you a question. He says, have you been totally honest? Have you told me everything? Are you holding back? And I said, Remember, you said before you answered that, you said you'd be willing to go to anything else for break you over alcohol. I said, yeah. I said, yeah, I'm holding something back. He says, well, I thought you said you wanted to be free. I said, I do. He says, well, you need to drop it, Lindell. So I dropped it. I turned over every, every stone. I illuminated every dark nook and cranny in my life. And I was able to get free. I walked through that arch, right, that they talk about, a free man. I was able to look the world in the eyes at last, right? Right. My sponsor had told me, Linda, you know, you, you, you ain't broke no records and you're not unique. Some of the stuff you did, I did. And, and, I, and he did some stuff that was worse than I did. So, 
So then I found out, he said, welcome to the human race. Wow. I'd been holding on to all of this stuff for years. And it was just a matter of the human condition. And then the sixth step, he, I didn't know it, but he was writing down all of my character defects. And then he gave them to me and he says, what are character defects? I said, I have no clue. I said, well, okay, so I remember what, lying, stealing? And he said, yeah. And he says, how many do you think you have? I said, well, I, I don't know. So he gave me a list of like about 49 of them, <laughs> right? And I said, wow, really? And then we did the seventh step where we got on our knees. We did, we did the third step prayer on our knees and we did the seventh step prayer on our knees, right? And humbly asked God to remove these shortcomings from me. And I thought it was something that once again, I had some power to do, right? Okay, thank you. Um, bottom line is, is that I don't have anything to do with that. That's, that. that's what God does. He removes those things that block me, right? From my ability to serve him and to help others. And then the eighth step I already had my list from the fourth step. And then in the ninth step, I, I made all of my amends, my direct amends to such people wherever possible, except when to enter them or others, right? I did that. Most of them were dead, including my mother. Uh, my time is up, and I'm going I'm to share this, and I'm going to be quiet. Um, I had to write letters because they weren't physically there. That didn't get me out of the out of the out of the work. I had to write letters, and I still have to take the letter to my mother because you see, my mother, I was on an alcoholic binge run for six months, and I went to go visit her just to let her know I was still alive. And she wasn't sitting in the window in her bedroom, smoking on her more cigarette, drinking her cup of coffee, seeing the smoke come through the screen. The window was closed. And I said, okay, she just went to the store. She didn't go anywhere. And a neighbor saw me that lived across the street, came around the corner, saw me sitting in the vehicle, pulled up next to the vehicle and said, Linda, how are you doing? I said, I'm fine. Full flight from reality, total denial. And she said, um, I'm sorry to hear about your mother. I said, well, what happened to my mother? Did she fall down the stairs and break her leg or something? She says, no, baby, your mother died. I says, what? I said, yeah. So I had to talk and only say, I'm just sitting between my legs. I took a couple of drinks because I need the courage to ask the next question. And I says, so when's the funeral? And I says, oh, you didn't know? I said, no, why? I said, your mother died and they buried her two weeks ago, Lindell. So when I tell you, I'm going to say this in closing, right? When I tell you that alcohol took everything from me that I cared about, that was close to me and that I loved, I mean exactly that. I got my kids back today. Uh, I practice the disciplines of 10, 11, and 12. I cannot transmit something that I don't have. I can't. When I carry the message of Alcoholics Anonymous, it's because I have had a spiritual awakening as a result of steps one through nine, right? And including all 12 steps, right? In their entirety, consecutively and in order. And having had a spiritual awakening as a result of the steps, I try to carry this message. What message? The message of the 12 steps to the next suffering alcoholic. And to practice, to try to practice these principles in all of my affairs. My time is up. I hope something, if you're new, was read, said, or shared that will help you maybe to examine your relationship to alcohol and that you don't have to go far as far down the scale as I did. I'm going to share this simple story and then it's a little bit of humor that I tell you a lot of sad stuff there, right? But there's a guy, he's an alcoholic, he's walking down the street and he falls into a ditch and this ditch is really deep and he can't get out on his own. So, there's a guy that's coming up the street, right? And it's a priest. And he's, hey, 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 can you help me? I need to get, I can't get out. I'm falling in this hole. I can't get out. And the priest says, oh, I can't help you, son, but I'll pray for you. And he keeps going. And then another guy comes down the street, right? And he says, hey, I, can't make, I need to get some help getting out of this hole. I can't get out. He says, bro, look, I, I can't help you, man. But then there's an alcoholic coming up the street. And he said, hey, bro, I'm, I'm stuck down here and I can't get out. Can you help me? So the alcoholic jumps down in the hole with the guy. And the guy says, oh, man, why did you do that? Now we're both stuck down here. He goes, yeah, but I know the way out. <laughs> My name is Lindell. I'm a recovered alcoholic. Thanks for letting me share. <laughs> Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.